Hello everyone. In the last week, we talked about uh, flow tangency boundary conditions. So basically, uh, this is a question about the camber slope, angle of attack, and uh, the uh, sort of the normal velocities from the potential of the airfoils. Okay. So the main idea of thin airfoil theory is that the kind of main approxim approximation versus source vortex panel method, which is for arbitrary airfoil, is that we will assume the airfoil to be thin enough and with smaller, a small angle of attack, such that we can instead, using a distribution of point vorticities, uh, placing them on a um, uh, sort of the, uh, distribute them along the chord length, which is basically from x to zero to x to, to c. And then we will just use this, uh, uh, this sort of potential flow together with the free stream to construct uh, sort of the flow around the thin air for your theory. And we, we will use, uh, we have shown that we will use the uh, non-penetration boundary conditions. And that's actually forms a fundamental equations for thin air for theory. So here, uh, we construct the potential flow with a distribution of point vorticities and point vortex with unknown uh, vortex strength density called the gamma x. So gamma x is something we don't know, but uh, we will we'll like to find it out. Uh, so uh, here's a little bit of comment about the distribution of vorticities. So the gamma x is actually the vortex strength, basically circulation per unit length. So any small segment uh, from x to x plus delta x can be approximately seen as a point vortex placed at the center of that segment with the vortex strength uh, gamma x times the dx. Remember that still at the same before, the positive mean clockwise. Uh, that's the convention in aerodynamics. And then the, if you're using momentum uh, conservations and mass conservations, you can actually show that a very interesting conclusion that the gamma x uh, physically it represents the velocity difference between the upper surface and lower surface. Remember that here in the thin airflow theory, we only have a very thin sheet of the um, of the uh, you know of where you know the uh, point vortices are pl are placed. So this is sort of the only geometry we have, and. Uh, this geometry besides the you know the slope of the camber lens. and then you see basically um, there would be a velocity discontinuities along the y directions. So if you further think about Kodak conditions, which basically means the uh, flow should uh, come out of the uh, trailing edge smoothly, that means there should be no velocity difference at the trailing edge. That means gamma c should be zero, using the using the above equations over there. Great. So how to figure out the gamma x? If we can figure out the gamma x, we basically figure out the potential flow around the thin airfoil. And we basically can get everything, just like we did before in a flow of cylinders, things like that. So now uh, we let's try first try to find a relation between the gamma x, the vorticity distributions, and the, uh, actually, this is actually a subscript a over there, and the a normal a sort of the a gradient of the uh, of the uh, airfoil potentials, and that airfoil potential basically corresponds to the uh, the contribution of of vertical velocity coming from the airfoil potential alone, not from the you know the free stream potential. Okay, so then we plug back to um, plug back the relation between the gamma x and uh, we we basically gonna rewrite this uh, phi a uh, partial phi a partial z as some so sort of expression of gamma x. Okay, and then we will plot this equation back to the flow tangency boundary conditions such that uh, flow tangency boundary conditions basically here such that we have the right hand side. We uh, we have everything on the left hand side, but the thing we don't know is the right hand side. Okay. Good. So now um, I want to talk about how to, f so if we, once we found the gamma x, 
So what? So once we find the gamma x, we can use the uh, kota Tchaikovsky lift theorem and integrating, uh, we can basically figure out what's the least lift contribution for each segment over there. Okay, for each segment over there, we can find out their own lift contributions. And once we figure out the lift contributions, we integrate it over the chord lens. Uh, yeah, we will get the total airfoil lift, for example. You can get even more things like aerodynamic center, things like that. We'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so finally, after, after we find the gamma x, uh, I just want to show you how important it is to find the distribution of uh, the vortex strength, the density. Then we can actually figure out the aerodynamic force for any airfoil. The reason why is if you look, if we look at the uh, flow tangency boundary conditions, the flow, uh, the sort of the airfoil information uh, come from the camber, sort of the slope of the camber. That's why where uh, the airfoil shape matters. Okay, then the if we, if we because this is given, so um, for any kind of so once you if you, you so for any fixed uh, sort of camber slope profile, there will be a corresponding sort of the. Uh, uh, you know, the partial f corresponding phi A, meaning there will be a corresponding uh, gamma X. Then we can find a close, we can find actually find a closed form relation between the airfoil shape and the gamma X, uh, which gamma X would give us the aerodynamic property. Therefore, we find the a sort of end-to-end -end relation between the airfoil shape and aerodynamic property. And this is the entire goal of aerodynamics of this class, okay? To give an airfoil shape, tell me what's aerodynamic property, right? Great. So now let's see how can we find out the, uh, the sort of basically the, this unknown term, the right-hand side in the flow tangency boundary conditions. Okay, so first recall that for any point vortex with the strength gamma placed at origin, just check your maybe lecture five notes over there. And you will see that the potential function evaluated at x, y location is the following expression. Uh, basically minus gamma over two pi uh, times the, the inverse tangent, uh, sort of the ac eight ac tangent function of y over x. But here, remember that in our coordinates, uh, we have x as core uh, in our sort of uh, in the thin airfoil theory, uh, we use z actually as the direction normal to the string lens to replace x. Uh, just a convention here. So now um, instead of so you can just you know replacing the y over there just as z. Okay. So if the above point vortex is evaluated at x naught z, okay, then you just replace x with x naught and y with uh, z. Right, so this equation is very easy to understand. This is a potential function. If you have any question about the potential function, you should go back and look at the notes in lecture five. Okay, um, so now if the above point vortex is centered in not in origin, okay, previously it's in origin, right? Now it's not in origin. I'm gonna shift it to um, to x zero. Basically, shift to the right or the left uh, by amount of x. Um, if x is positive, I'm going to shift it to the right. If x is negative, I'm going to shift the point of vortex to the left. So after I shift the point of vortex, what's the potential you know, corresponding, uh, the value of the potential function at x naught z? Okay, still the same x naught z before, but now the point of vortex is, shipped, is kind of sh uh, shifted its location. So uh, what should you change here? You should change um, right now. Uh, change the x naught, the expression here, into x naught minus x. Okay, so that's something you should change. And then once you change that, this is basically the expression you need. Um, this is the expression for the shifted point vortex evaluated at x naught zero. So uh, by definition, of, for our problem, uh, our definition is that uh, you know by definition, the thing alpha theory here. We're using a distribution of point vortex to represent the 
uh, uh, phi a, so sort of the airfoil potential. Therefore, uh, you just need to integrate uh, the bulb potential if you wanted to sort of find the total potential function of those point vortex, point vortex you just integrate them. And the gamma here would be, uh, would be just the gamma density, of strength density times the dx. And then you, if you're integrating this term, you're basically just replacing the gamma with this gamma x times dx, and then you integrate them over zero to c. And that basically tells you the total uh, integrated potential function, which is the phi a, evaluated at x naught z. Okay, this expression is very important. Once we get that, we can, com we can, we can compute the right-hand side of our flow tangent uh, C boundary conditions. So let me just go back to the flow tangent equations. Okay, right, these equations basically tell you it's going to compute the normal derivative, a uh, partial derivative, partial phi a, partial z, evaluated as z equals to zero, meaning that uh, uh, it's a function, this is a total expression, uh, would, would, be, would be a function of, uh, uh, would be a function of x. And, uh, and because you fix the, the z as zero, okay, it will be a function of x only. Okay, the, the function of, of, of x, okay, good. So now, um, okay, so now, uh, so now if you look at this equation over there, actually what I'm doing here is, uh, I'm actually evaluating this, uh, I'm actually evaluating, uh, so the, uh, I'm actually evaluating, uh, so this term here, basically it tells you the sort of the velocity, normal velocity contributions from the airfoil potential, basically the sum of all the point of vorticity at the location x not uh, zero, actually. Uh, if, if, you, if you put, uh, if you, you if you evaluate z uh, at you know if you if you evaluate z, you if you evaluate z at zero okay it will just correspond to that point okay good so so basically what you're gonna do you're just gonna take the derivative uh, respect to the partial derivative with respect to z as you can see z has nothing to do with x z only has to do z only has to do with this term so uh, so recall that the the tangent uh, my uh, tangent x, if you derivative of that, would be uh, one over x one plus x square. Therefore, you get the following expression over there. And then you see when you plug z equals to zero inside, uh, basically you will cancel out one x zero minus x. So you end up with this term over there. So this term basically tells you uh, sort of the um, sort of the 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 um, uh, basically, this this term tells you the right hand side of the flow tangency equations, but instead of using x, it's using x naught. It's just a minor sort of variable change of variable. It doesn't matter at all. Okay, so so now we have the right hand side of the flow tangency boundary conditions represented as a function of gamma, and actually as an integration of the function of gamma. Okay. So it's kind of a little bit different from previously. You have maybe you have seen before. Previously, all those equations that you see is probably algebraic relations. For example, the x squared is y or x cubic is y. Now it's a little bit different. It's it's gonna be an integration of the function uh, that give you basically the relation. Okay, good. So now, uh, so finally, right now we can actually go back to our flow tangency boundary conditions. So here you see, uh, please pay attention to the notation here. Here I basically switch x to x naught, uh, because I'm because when I'm integrating this equation, I'm using variable x. So I, I was trying to make a distinction so you won't get confused. Okay, so this equation. So this is the same thing before uh, the left hand side. I hope you can still recognize it. Everything is the same, except I change the uh, the x naught basically. And basically, the only thing I changed is the x naught. So, um, uh, so I change x to x naught. Okay. So, so now th this is the right hand side over there, and this is the uh, left hand side. 
Okay, great. So if I if I want to, uh, and this equation has to hold for any x naught in x uh, in, in between uh, zero and c. So that's a very strong condition. That means uh, for any x naught, there has to be a perfect balance between the local camber slope, which come from the L four geometry, uh, and the local uh, sort of angle of attack. This balance, the perfect balance, has to be hold with an integration of gamma x and involving a function related to x naught. And whenever, whatever, no, no matter what x naught I choose, this equation has to hold. So this is actually a pretty strong uh, conditions. Okay, it's a pretty strong conditions. So, so if I can re rearrange this uh, above equation into uh, here, uh, I kind of rearrange it. I, so basically what I did is I move, I, I, let me see what I did here. I think what I did here is I move the factor two pi uh, out of it, the equation, and I move the u infinity to the, so the right-hand side, then put the right-hand side into the left-hand side. So basically on the left-hand side, I have this expression. This expression basically, um, tells me uh, the unknown is gamma x, of course, the gamma x is unknown. It's something I don't know. And uh, on the right-hand side is the angle of attack, which is something I know, and the slope of the camber line, which come from the airfoil geometry. So this is the only way airfoil geometry comes in, okay? Then, of course, we have a quota condition. And now we're gonna solve uh, this equation, okay? So this is the thing we know. We know alpha, we know the slope, we know c. We're gonna solve gamma x. Note here, we are not going to solve gamma x as a value or something, a number. No, the gamma x here is a function. It's the first time that we will figure out how to solve a function. And this equation in mathematics, it's called the integral equation. Uh, usually, you won't see these kind of equations, uh, at least I would say in most of the classes in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, this is probably, the, this is, at least this for me, this is the only place I, I have seen, in, I have to solve an integral equation. So I will talk about details about how to solve integral equations 